Well, thank you very much for giving uh, me the opportunity to come uh, along and uh, present uh, more on somalogic. Um, the title of the talk is Redefining Disease and, uh, and Outcomes. Um, in terms of the contents of my talk, um, I'm going to break it down into several sections. I'm going to do a, a, a recap on the SOMASCAN proteomics assay so you understand what it is that we're measuring. Um, I'm going to show how the unique combination of attributes can be used to develop uh, better surrogate biomarkers. And in terms of better, uh, I'm also referring to the fact that proteins uh, can capture the dynamic aspects of a disease. Um, so we've, we're able to develop surrogate biomarkers to reflect disease status and also responses to intervention. I'm going to switch then to talking about how we can use the broad capacity of the SOMASCAN assay to uncover underlying dis uh, disease biology, which is what uh, w one of the main thrusts of the project is all about. And I'm going to give a, a, a distinct example of a disease reclassification uh, project uh, dealing with a, a complex disease and then summarize. So the, the SOMASCAN technology um, most people, when they talk about uh, proteomics, think about mass spectrometry. Um, mass spectrometry has been around for, for many years. It's constantly being improved. But SOMASCAN was developed really from the ground up. Um, and at the core of the technology, uh, we've, uh, at the starting point for the redevelopment of, of, of this platform, was the creation of a novel class of protein binders. If you take single-stranded DNA molecules, about 50 to 70 bases in length, and put them into solution along with proteins, some of the times you find binders. So if you start with a random library, different sequences of single-stranded DNA and, and uh, incubate those with a, a, a purified protein, there's a good chance you'll pull something out that binds. And this is um, this is the basis of something called the Aptima technology. But what Somalogic uh, realized is that if you uh, substituted one of the, the bases within uh, a single-stranded DNA structure for a uracil uh, containing a, a novel uh, side chain, something that you're more likely to see in, in an, uh, a protein or within an amino acid uh, within a protein sequence, you can really increase the affinity and the duration of binding. And finding these really high affinity uh, binders is, a, is a, a key aspect of, of developing very specific uh, assays. And so what we've done is we've taken random libraries of these modified oligonucleotides, incubated them with individual purified proteins. And these can be intracellular proteins, extracellular proteins, or the soluble domains of, of uh, um, membrane-based receptors, for example. And then we've, we've selected specific binders one by one and then incorporated those into what we call the SOMASCAN assay. And the SOMASCAN assay works like this. We actually uh, immobilize these individual protein binders um, onto uh, magnetic beads. We incubate those with uh, a clinical sample containing the various proteins and we allow complexes to form. And through a, a series of automated processes you can remove the unbound proteins and you can remove unbound somomas so you're left with one-to-one -one complexes. And what we do then is we we purify those complexes through a series of wash steps and then break the complexes apart and read the DNA molecule, this, this molecule here. Um, we've incorporated into this a fluorescent label, and we can read uh, and, and determine the concentration of this using very simple microarray technology. So we're now converting a really complex protein measurement into a, a, a simple DNA readout. And so this is offering us the capacity to, to, to build very reproducible assays, and this has been tested um, actually in the labs of some of the people here. 
Um, it's really sensitive where we need it. It's broad in terms of the, s the scale. We've done this, we're doing this now routinely for 5,000 proteins. And it's broad in terms of the dynamic range of the assay, so we can read concentrations across a billion-fold uh, concentration range, which is one of the things that has, has um, held back things like uh, mass spectrometry. And what we're really realizing is this is now scalable, so we can scale this up uh, to huge uh, studies, and we're now running some of the biggest proteomic studies that have ever been run. And having that scalability really allows us to start to, to work with, um, with, with large populations. Um, and it allows us to, to identify the best surrogates for outcomes. So I did talk about this at a previous meeting where in one of our largest uh, studies, uh, which was published last year, we were looking to see if we could improve on existing um, secondary event, uh, ca cardiovascular event um, prediction. So if someone has had some sort of event in the, f um, we can take a blood sample after um, they've gone through a stabilization period and then assess whether someone is likely to have another event. And we were trying to improve on conventional types of clinical parameters, uh, in some cases, uh, some of those parameters will not change in response to increasing or decreasing risk or in response to intervention. So we're really looking for, for dynamic biomarkers. So by doing, um, looking at event rates, so looking at in a population of 938 uh, patients with stable coronary heart disease with a 10-year follow-up, um, these were followed up for death, MI, stroke, uh, ischemia, or, or hospitalization, uh, and heart failure, uh, we used this uh, 938 um, plasma sample bank as a, a basis of creating a nine uh, protein model with a four year uh, composite endpoint. Um, and then what we did is took, took those, uh, took, took the, the model fixed it and then tested in a, a, a completely different cohort from, from Norway. And this is called the Hunt 3 uh, study, where samples were collected under real world conditions. And the data for, um, it's, it's 1,300, I think, I can't remember the exact number, proteins that were measured. All of this data is available to, uh, to this consortium for, for, for digging into. And we went through, um, we went through this uh, mathematical process for finding uh, predictive biomarkers. So um, we went through a process of analyzing for one, 1,130 proteins. We use univariate Cox regression, so look for those proteins which were directly um, uh, linked to uh, event rates. We then selected ones which had a, gave a meaningful hazard ratio, so this is very much done on a protein by protein basis. But then the next point was to switch to a machine learning approach. Um, our design brief um, back then was to try and shrink uh, the number of proteins down that we could use in a predictive model to the minimum number so that you could trans translate this technology onto a, a, a cheaper or a smaller panel assay but uh, that has changed. We realize that we do not have to do this. But we went through this process of using machine learning uh, where we sought the, the, the minimum number of proteins which gave the maximum uh, predictive capability. And then we eliminated, uh, 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 through backwards elimination, uh, further proteins. If you actually... Uh, look at the, the protein list that was selected by Lasso, this is almost a discovery uh, example because although we allowed Lasso to, to um, compare and factor in all of the, um, the traditional biomarkers, none of them, perhaps apart from troponin, were actually selected. They didn't add much weight to the predictive model. Um, and just to, to 
to talk you through this type of analysis. This is a this is a, 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 a Q5 to Q1 hazard ratio where what we're doing is comparing those individuals that have got a, um, the highest level of a highest signal for MMP7, for instance. And we know that they have got a four times increased uh, chance of having an event than someone that has got the lowest level of MMP7. And similarly, if you look at GDF11, if someone has got a reduced amount of uh, reduced signal uh, of GDF11, then they're more likely to have a subsequent event. So we know that there's hidden biology in here. We've looked at other types of experiments to support um, uh, our understanding, uncover new biology relating to some of these observations. Um, so it is a discovery platform as well. If you actually fix um, the event prediction model uh, and then look at how that performs. So this is, this is a hazard ratio analysis based on the final risk score. We know that it performs consistently better than genetics and conventional uh, clinical parameters. Um, there is a, a bias uh, in terms of its predictive performance for certain types of, uh, of, of event and it's markedly improved uh, for, for heart failure. So we've got this capacity to, to predict um, uh, events, but what about capturing disease dynamics? Going back to the uh, discovery and the validation schema for, for the study I've just talked about, um, we had another uh, chance to use um, multiple uh, serial samples taken from 514 uh, individuals where 139 of uh, individuals that had had uh, one event then went on to, to develop a, a second event and we had samples taken at baseline and 4.8 years later with the event subsequent to this. So we used this, this arm to then understand how the, the response prediction um, would change as uh, an individual approached their second event. And if you look at this type of, uh, of plot, and this, this plot here shows the four, uh, a four-year risk score where we have um, samples taken, this is the analysis of samples taken at baseline, and then this is this is following up. These are with patients without events. There's a slight increase. Um, we see a, a slight increase with refit framing them uh, parameters as well. So there is an increase in risk, and that's likely uh, due to uh, an increased risk associated with normal aging. But if you then start to switch, if you look at this chart here, where we actually look at people with events. Although Framingham doesn't uh, show a incre uh, massive increase in risk, using this risk prediction score, we see a marked, a marked uh, increase in, in risk. So we've got the capacity to, to uh, detect those patients that have got uh, an increase in risk as they approach their second event. So what about measuring response to intervention? Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to access samples from um, something called the Illuminate study, and this is uh, Pfizer's um, CETP inhibitor study in which 15,000 individuals were entered, a, uh, entered into a trial. Um, half received uh, torcetrapib and, uh, and a statin, the standard of care, um, versus individuals that had received uh, statin only. And the trial was stopped after about 18 months um, because the number of uh, cardiovascular events in increased in the trial arm versus the control arm. And actually, the number of all-cause deaths increased in the trial arm over the control arm. So what could we learn uh, about the performance of this type of predictive uh, this predictive algorithm in the context of a trial like this. Um, 
our contacts at Pfizer said, well, we haven't got samples from uh, early and late stage, but we have got some samples. We've got paired samples where we've taken uh, samples at baseline and just three months later. But it's only for 472 subjects. So this is the sort of the, the, the numbers you might expect in a phase two study. So we had, we took the samples from 472 subjects about 250 had received uh, the combination therapy and, and the other half had not received. They just re received the statin only. And we did a comparison of, between these different groups. Um, and what we, we can show, um, what we can show is that if you have um, a statin um, this is a, a decrease in the, uh, in the absolute risk over the three months. Um, and this is, we, we think, is due to the continued beneficial effect of, of dose optimization of, of the statin. Whereas in people that had had um, the, the torcetrapib drug, the increase went up. Now, is that limited to people that... Uh, had events, or is it a general? Well, we actually went on and analyzed this, so we broke down the groups further. We showed that in individuals that had received just, a torvus, uh, just the statin drug, there was a, a decrease whether you had events or not, so there was a decrease in risk, whereas in those that had had torcetrapib, you'd had an increase, and a particularly marked increase in those that had had events. So, we know that there's a capacity of this, this process of developing biomarkers to, to be able to measure uh, response to intervention. So I'm going to switch now to how we can use the same platform to uncover underlying disease biology. So the Illuminate study was stopped after 18 months because of this increase in cardiovascular de events but it was also stopped because there were these other uh, non-cardiovascular disease. Um, so 24 people in the treatment arm versus 14 people in the control arm actually succumbed to cancer and uh, nine succumbed to, to sepsis. So can we use the, the broad capacity of this technology to uncover what's going on? I know this is a man-made disease. It's a drug-induced disease but the processes that we go through are similar to what we might go through if we're starting to uncover uh, novel disease biology. So by comparing groups, you can start to look at changes in multiple proteins. And this is just a snapshot of a, a, a few of the proteins where the blue ones, the, the blue arrows here, correlated with um, uh, a positive uh, change in HDL levels, so an increase in HDL. And the the um, the black um, the black uh, arrows indicated the uh, measurement changes in in a range of other proteins. But if you start to understand um, how the pathways are made up, you know, could you start to infer you know how you know what biology is being affected by this drug? So in the case of um, this particular trial, the trial had already uncovered a number of uh, changes, so the, the, the trialists knew that uh, aldosterone increased, and therefore, um, through salt reabsorption, you know, uh, surmised that that was driving up blood pressure, but we actually picked up some of the, the other changes that were going on, and that's so we reinforced the picture, we completed the jigsaw piece um, as to what was going on at a mechanistic level. Um, and the other changes that we started to, to see, which weren't measured before by taking this broad, I hate to say fishing experiment type approach because it's got a very negative connotation, but that's what it is. Um, you know, we, we saw reductions in, in some of the pituitary hormones and that inferred that there was actually an increase in andro and androgen uh, secretion, and we know that with andro uh, increased androgen secretion, there's a, 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 a platelet aggregability uh, problem that can lead, lead to, to, to clots. So through this type of uh, 
uh, broad uh, approach, you know, can we start to infer uh, the effects of, of drugs in this case um, on looking at the direct impact on, on the adrenal gland? Switching to um, the, the cancer and the sepsis deaths, similarly, we, we picked up changes using this uh, broad, uh, um, broad net uh, fishing type approach, we picked up a whole range of different uh, changes. And we know that, for example, angiopoietin 2 is released by monocytes uh, when, in, in the case of sepsis. So we're already starting to, um, starting to surmise that actually what, we're, what that drug is doing, what the CETP inhibitor is doing, is somehow uh, impacting immune tolerance. And so that means that as immune tolerance is increased, you get uh, decreased surveillance for infection or cancer. So you can build up these sy systems biology views. Actually, I, I had slides here. I've actually taken them out. But you can start to combine the, data, the type of data we generate with data. Um, we've, we've generated a whole bunch of Mendelian randomization data, we understand the associations between certain genotypes and our protein uh, and the protein measurements that we make. Um, there's a publication in, pro in, in progress; it's just been reviewed, and um, and the data will be made publicly available, um, probably through some of the partners in this in, in this uh, meeting. But the conclusions from just one egg, one uh, study is that not only can you um, you can find biomarkers which are better surrogates of outcomes. Um, you can start to uncover uh, the, the mechanistic basis of some of these uh, adverse um, uh, drug effects. And you can do all of this type of work in, in quite a, a small um, study size. I'm going to switch, before I summarize, to uh, one um, emerging example where we've actually um, developed SOMASCAN data which has gone on to help redefine another complex disease. So if you go and talk to uh, asthma clinicians, they talk about mild, moderate or severe s asthma. Um, they, they don't actually go much beyond that. Um, the, the disease is poorly defined at, at a molecular level. In the context of UBiopred, which is an IMI1 project, uh, they, built huge, they built a huge cohort, and they were looking for biomarkers which were surrogates for those classical clinical labels. And I think they got so frustrated that they said, well, let's try a different approach. Let's, you know, it's a particularly complex cohort. There are all sorts of medications, all sorts of comorbidities, so it, it just seems so similar to our situation uh, within big data at heart. And SOMASCAN was used uh, in a process where they used a 1.1K assay, so it's a, an older version of the assay, but they used unsupervised class selection. Um, so a, te a technique known as topological data analysis, what that means, I'm not sure. Um, it, is, it is so complex. Um, but what, they, what it does, it, it looks for features in, in complex data and uses machine learning to constantly sharpen up um, the view of those different features and then starts to look at using different, um, looks at different parameters, including proteins, clinical variables, all the things that we've talked about today, to d redefine what the subgroups are. And then looking, at, looking towards orthogonal methods um, you can then start to consider whether some of those, uh, those subgroups are maintained using uh, alternative analysis processes. And uh, this is the output um, from the, a company that was involved in, in um, reclustering the disease. And each of these nodes represents, as far as I understand it, an individual patient and you find that patients, once you've gone through this process, cluster into different uh, disease subgroups. So they, they, they share commonalities. 
Um, and the ones that are, have got rings around them are those that are currently uh, considered by clinicians. They've got an idea of who will who is responding to steroids. They talk about neutrophilic and eosinophilic severe asthma. But what this uh, unbiased, unsupervised approach is doing is revi revealing all sorts of other groups that actually are unlikely to be responding to, to current interventions. Um, so we've now got you know, a number of additional groups here that represent unmet clinical need. And these are the, the patients that are being failed by the current therapies uh, and should be the target for, um, for future therapies. And that's where Ubiopred is right now. They're just relaunching the second phase of the project to go and start to, um, to look at druggability and, and deconvolute the biology further. So um, those are the types of approaches that we're also taking. Um, we're, we're just starting in this process. If you look at um, what I've talked about, it's very much aligned with um, the work package four objectives that we have. So it is about di dissecting disease and uncovering uh, biology. It's capturing disease dynamics. And I think this is really important because you mentioned earlier, one of the questions you had for, for a colleague was, where do you see this going? Um, we see, and I'll come on to this in a, in a minute. Um, but what we do want to do is start to build big data, a big data knowledge base. We want to build uh, virtual avatars of patients so that you can compare a patient back with, with a, an in silico version and understand what, what type of intervention has worked for that person. And of course, we've got to consider how we can deploy this and operationalize this uh, in different settings where comorbidities are um, considered and in ways that we can support some of the, the novel um, clinical trials that are, are, are being uh, considered. But all of this fits in with Somalogic's uh, vision because what we aim to do is, is use the Somascan platform to deliver uh, a key biological insight. So this could be um, secondary event risk it might be primary event risk. It might be um, a, dif a differential diagnostic which informs the clinician how to uh, intervene with this particular patient. And I think that the key thing that is missing from a lot of uh, diagnostic um, biomarker strategies, usually the, the biomarkers are fixed. And in our case, what we're trying to do is build up these biomarker uh, sets these biological insights which allows us to evaluate the effect but then use that then to guide and change the intervention um, and we think that this is the vision for um, the emerging accountable care organizations um, which are going to be focused on outcomes as a value driver as opposed to delivering an intervention as a value driver and I'll leave it there Um, actually, I will just, so I, I did mention um, the fact that SOMASCAN data has been uh, used in, in building uh, additional, um, additional data resources in, a, uh, in something called the Interval Project. Um, SOMASCAN data has been collected as an intermediary phenotype along with a whole range of other uh, intermediary phenotypes. And this has been done in, although it's uh, uh, healthy blood donors, um, it's still useful um, for starting to deconvolute the biology. And we've, there are certain, uh, there's a certain number of uh, genetic associations uh, with protein measurements based on SOMASCAN, which will be made available through PhenoScanner. Maybe we'll even look at those later, I don't know. Um, but this is in publication, it's, it's, it's not yet, uh, yet finalised. And that's uh, John Bandish's It is. And will that be part of this I think it's going to be publicly available, yes. Um, we just got to go through, it's, it's the, 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 
the publication is um, is just being uh, amended and resubmitted. So it will be a, a soma scan database resource that we can use for deconvoluting biology. So I have a question. Um, what about um, quality of blood samples? How important is it for soma logic that the blood sample is very fresh? Do you see differences between new and older blood samples? Um, yeah, it's a fantastic question. It is very pertinent. Um, we have analyzed samples that have been banked at minus 80 for 20 years, and they're fine. I mean, there's, there's survival of enough of the proteins to be able to find signals. Um, I would say that what is critical, though, is, is whether you can process a sample within two to four hours of collection. And by processing, what I mean is spinning down and at least getting into minus 20, and we prefer EDTA plasma. Um, but we don't go through any you know, unique process. These are pretty standard um, you know, blood draw and processing techniques. Um, actually, what we have done is we've taken blood samples and systematically abused them. So we've left them on the bench for s different amounts of times. So we know what proteins are affected. Um, and we, we can either use the changes that we measure as a way of quality controlling samples um, or in some cases we've actually used a mathematical correction approach to um, to infer what the the results would have looked like so there are a number of different things that we can do but we like to have samples that are collected two to four hours and then put it to uh, minus 20. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, th you work completely on human um, proteins and human samples, right? Not animals. Um, about a third of the 5,000 uh, somomas, the protein binders, will cross-react with um, murine rat. Um, we've tested for cross-reactivity with other species as well. Um, but you have to remember that they're, they're generated against purified proteins. And so we're relying on the fact that there's a homology uh, between the different species. Um, we're not focusing necessarily on analysis of, of those other species because we, I think we're shortchanging science if we're, we're fudging a technology, we're applying it in a way that it's not designed. I understand that the background of the question was your example around Tourette's because you could have potentially seen some of the off-target effects if you would have analyzed the animal data from dogs. Um, that might be so, but uh, we didn't access those samples, so, yeah. There was just, we, we used the Illuminate study just as a, an exemplar. I'll come round. It's like being a, a show host, isn't it? <laughs> the, the actual protein levels, do you get the units or do you get arbitrary units, so to speak? Um, for, for our purposes, we, we, we don't worry about converting um, the, we, we actually report in uh, relative fluorescence units. We know that if there's a doubling in the number of fluorescence units in terms of a signal, it correlates with a doubling of the amount of the protein. If we're really interested in understanding the concentration of a protein, then we can build standard curves. We can put, use a purified protein or a sample which is being calibrated, and we can develop a standard curve and then read the relative fluorescence units from that, but we don't tend to do this. Something else that I should uh, talk about is the fact that um, our original um, thinking is that we would use SOMASCAN to develop, identify and develop biomarkers, but then switch to a low plex assay where we might go and do some of this quantification workup. Um, but actually what we're choosing to do now 
is to stay on the same platform. So whatever you discover, um, whatever we discover as part of this consortium, we will actually deliver as a 5,000 plex assay. Um, in which case we might then go back and um, start thinking about calibrating some of those proteins if it's, if it's needed. Let me ask you a question of the two of you guys who presented the last two. Let me ask you a question. I think you, got, you are significantly closer to the actual disease biology because you're really looking at proteins and, and what, what impact they have. Um, while you presented on, on certain genes, and you're not quite sure what they actually expressed. Um, how does the two of you intend to work together? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think that if we can find cohorts where you've got the genetic data and we're also developing the proteomic data, there's an opportunity to, to start to, to validate some of the observations using Mendelian randomization. So you would use the availability of variation, known variation in certain genes, to understand whether the proteins that we see are implicated in, in the disease process. That's, that's how I see it. It's and you can then overlay onto that expression data so you can perhaps see that your genetic variant determines gene expression and that gene expression determines protein abundance. Um, more sophisticated analysis looking at Kind of protein truncating variants and all sorts of other functional consequences of, of genetic variation. Bring that all together and you have a very powerful toolbox for <laughs> instrumenting all of these proteins genetically and then using them in many randomization ex experiments. I have a question for you. Can you explain a little bit, I don't mean to put you, you know, on the spot, but you know, explaining the relevance of having understanding cis and trans affect transacting variants because that's something that we have uncovered as part of the interval study. Yeah. So this distinction is, is really critical. So if you go back to the CRP example I showed at the beginning, I showed a, a variant in the CRP gene influences CRP protein concentration, has no effect on coronary heart disease risk. There are variants in a number of other genes that influence CRP concentration. One of those genes is APOE. So APOE, we know, influences a whole range of things, lipids, inflammation, all sorts, and including CRP concentration. Those APOE variants also associate quite strongly with CHD risk. So you could erroneously use variants in APOE to instrument CRP concentration and look at the association of the APOE variant with CRP and with CHD risk and make the incorrect conclusion that CRP causes coronary heart disease because you've used this APOE variant. What is really happening is that there are other biological pathways to the side of CRP that are, that are having that cause and effect on, on coronary heart disease. And that context is called a, a trans Mendelian randomization where you're, the gene that you're using as an instrument for your protein is not the gene that encodes that protein. It's some other gene that happens also to have an effect on your protein of interest. That's trans, and that's very risky. What we're doing here is cis Mendelian randomization, where you're using the gene that encodes your protein of interest to ask questions about your, the causal role of your protein in a disease outcome. It's a far safer way of doing it. There are ways of doing trans randomization that are being developed uh, quite sophisticated and effective ways, but when you boil it down to the, the raw biology, cis Mendelian randomization is the most appropriate for looking at drug targets because you're dealing with a, a protein which must have an encoding gene that's likely to have uh, useful variants within it. Does that help? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> This is how we work together. <laughs> I have a question to 
to uh, the specific specificity of uh, of your targeting the, the protein. Uh, I can imagine that that uh, one DNA uh, can uh, yeah m m exactly bind to mul multiple or the same but dysfunctional protein. Uh, is there any any thinking to to increase the uh, um, yeah discernibility of different forms of uh, of proteins? Um, first of all, um, when the proteins are of a high enough abundance in clinical samples, we actually use the protein binder that we've selected to pull out a protein and then analyze the protein using mass spectrometry so we know what we're pulling out. Um, that only works where you have proteins that are high enough of high enough abundance to be able to, to put onto a mass spec. So some of what we're doing is blind. Um, it's not great, but it's, that's, that's what we work with. But statistically, we've shown that um, we're pretty selective. We don't know why this is. We think it's a characteristic of the somas, particularly with the modifi with, where those modifications play a role. They actually align to create a binding face, and we think that adds a great deal of specificity to the interaction compared to conventional aptamers. In terms of um, testing, uh, another way of testing specificity, if we know that a protein is part of a larger superfamily, if you like, we take all of the um, additional proteins that have got anything greater than a 40% homology and test the binding to the, the individual somas. And if we see cross-talk, they're thrown away. Um, so part of what we're doing right now is, is we, we go through a reversioning of the assay periodically. We're fixing on the next version of the assay. We're picking all of the best performing somas and we're gonna stick with that for as long as we can. Um, but we do, we do consider specificity as a, you know, as a, as a big um, criterion for what we select and, and put into the SOMA scan assay. Does that help? <laughs>